Son's holy name. reminder before we really get things fired up. Um, we're looking to continue to create a little bit more space. You guys have done a great, great job this morning, kind of spacing out. That's really good. If you are wanting to try the 830 service, it's exactly like this one. It's just at a different time. So uh, we're trying to see if we can't pull a little bit more people down the first service and create a little bit more room in the second service to kind of balance them out a little bit. Um, I feel like if I could balance the two services out that everyone spaced out, would be really cool. Um, I know some of us are just, we're 11 o'clockers and that's fine. But if you're thinking or toying around with a different time frame, 8.30 would be a great one. Try it for a couple weeks in a row. Like I said, it's the exact same service um, as the 11 o'clock service. Um, with that, I, I was sitting here in the worship service during the first song and I was like, man, this sounds so amazing. Like this just like, wow. Like I'm just in awe how awesome it sounds this morning. And then Craig texts me and says, hey, your mic's on. I was like, that explains it. And so uh, I had to go back and change my battery because my battery was dying. But um, sorry, y'all missed out on the rest of the worship service. I had my mic off. So um, you're probably thinking that's why it got better. Um, but uh, those join us live stream, um, Bolverde Assisted Living, we're so glad you guys are with us today online. Uh, today we're talking about how homes are better than tents. Now I gotta know, how many of you are campers? You, like, you love to camp, where are you at? Okay, all right. I like it to camp, I don't love to camp. Now, if I'm going on an RV, okay, or glamping or those kinds of things, like if I've got running water and AC and I'm just not at my home, um, like a hotel, those are really cool things. Uh, my wife says that she loves to camp under four stars. Um, that's the only kind of camping she loves to do. Um, I don't like to do the primitive thing, like like the whole go down to the river and wash your hands kind of thing. Um, if I'm camping, I wanna know where is the electricity at? Where's the running water at? Because at June, I wanna plug in my box fan and put it in the tent with me kind of a thing. I, I'm not kind of a camper. Um, but I know some of you guys are, you're, you're like, pack it in, pack it out, everything. And, you know, y'all are, y'all are awesome. Um, there will be a reward in heaven for you, I know, for that. Um, but homes are really better than tents. And, and the Apostle Paul makes this case here. Now, he's not really talking about camping in this moment, but that was a little, just a, an, an effort to be creative. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 1, Paul writes, he says this, for we know that the tent... That is our earthly home is destroyed and we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we were still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we were at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are good, of good courage, and we'd rather be away from the body and home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him." For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one of us, each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. If you're taking notes in the back of your bulletin today, the first thing is this, tents are temporary. Tents are temporary. I, I know when my kids are younger, they would like to camp. And sometimes they camp in their bedroom. Sometimes they camp in the living room. Sometimes they'd be brave enough to camp in the backyard. But they always kind of found a way to come back to the house. Temping, uh, uh, camping is a temporary event. No one goes and camps forever. You live in a tent in a temporary situation. Tents are temporary. I want you to understand this. If you hear my voice, here's what you can be certain of. Uh, certain of. Death is the reality. The moment you started living is the moment you started dying. Everything on this earth is temporary. Everything, even life itself. Understand that death is a reality. 
We go through life as if we're immortal, that there's nothing going to be happening to us, that there's no wrong. And we're so shocked when, some, when a tragedy strikes or we lose a loved one. But the thing is, we have to realize that by starting this journey on earth, we're going to have to finish it. By being alive, death is certain. See, Paul states this in chapter four of verse 16. If you look back a little bit, he says, so we don't lose heart though our outer self is wasting away. Paul states that this body we have is temporary. This tent we have is a temporary dwelling. It's a temporary house. Our bodies are not meant to last forever. These tents were given, were not designed to be our permanent residence. Yes, we're created in the image of God, but that doesn't mean that we have 10 fingers and 10 toes like God has it, or we have ears or eyes or any of those kinds of things. God is spirit. We're not created in the image of God in the sense that we look like him physically. A theological word for you that explains that is an anthropomorphism, which is when we see God, he reaches out or God listens to us. God doesn't have ears. God doesn't have hands to reach with. God is spirit. But we explain those things and we, we understand them those ways. And so that's an anthropomorphism. And so what we do is we, we realize that this housing that God has given us, we're made in his image, meaning in the likeness of him, his attributes, his shareable or his shareable attributes are who we are made like. But this body is not made like God. This body is a temporary house that God has given us and it is wasting away day by day. Now, I know that this last week I turned 42. I know some of y'all are like, you're a spring chicken. And some of you people are like, you're old. You know, I get, I'm right, right there in the in-between kind of thing. But I'm, all, I'm old enough to realize that I don't get to do everything the way I used to do it when I was 20. If I was playing softball right now, I don't play it like I did when I was 20, 23 years old. I, I can't go out and run a Spartan race as well as I did when I was 28 and 30 when I was you know, running those races. I, I'm a little older now. I'm a little more out of shape or have a little more shape, one of the two, if you, depends on how you look at it. Um, you know, I can't do the things I used to do. My body is wasting away. Now, I'm not, I'm not in my 80s. I'll never forget, I was at church one day, I won't mention the lady's name, but she dropped her keys and she was like, oh my goodness. And she kind of kicked them over to me. She's like, do you mind picking that up? She says, if I, if I go down there, I might not come up. <laughs> She's in a different phase where I was. I was like, sure. And I grabbed a hold of the counter and you know, bent down and got them for her. She knew better. If I go down, there ain't getting up back up. She understood that her body was wasting away. She couldn't do the things that she had used to be able to do. This is a temporary housing. We can't be shocked when we, when we come into, into a life and realize that we're, we're not able to do the things we used to be able to do. Paul says, you have a tent. Tents are temporary. Now, here is one thing that is eternal. I wrote here, the only thing you can take from this life to the next is your family. Now, I don't mean, I had to explain, my wife says, hey, you need to explain that a little better in the second service. I don't mean like when you die, you grab a hold of your kids, you're like, you're coming with me kind of a thing. Well, they would love that. I'm sure they would. But what I really mean by that, what you, the only thing you can take to heaven with you is your family is the legacy of who Christ is and teaching them to understand who Jesus is, what he has done for them, for them to make a decision so that when their life ends, you can be reunited in heaven. But just because you have the same job as your dad had, just because you drove the same kind of car, none of those things that we strive to achieve or to acquire for ourselves, we can't take any of it with us. When it comes to your children, your grandchildren, your spouse, that's where the investment is. Now, second thing is tents are uncomfortable. Now, I'm not trying to draw a line in the sand and you know, strike up war against the KOA or anything like that, but tents are uncomfortable. Listen to what Paul says here in verse two and four. He says, for in this tent we groan, 
longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked for while we were still in this tent, we groan and being burdened. He says he's being, he groans for this. Life on earth is hard. It has ways of humbling you, ways to keep you in check. And it's just the way things are. It doesn't mean that they're bad. It's just life has a way of humbling you sometimes and realizing that you need to depend on other people. You need to depend on other things. You can't do it all by yourself. And Paul says that he longs for this heavenly dwelling. He groans for it. And he says that he desires this for himself to be in heaven. But he's not right now, so he's gonna be here on, on the earth. But he groans for heaven. I got to thinking, and I looked up, you know, what does groan mean? What's, what, how can I explain this groaning? Is it not like he waked up in the, woke up in the morning and just went, <sighs> I'm not in heaven. Woe is me. Like, I, I don't think that's kind of the groan we're talking about. I like to think of it this way. You ever had your kids walk into the kitchen and go, mom, dad, what's for dinner? And you're like, it's spaghetti. In the first service, I said French toast. No one laughed out loud. They all chuckled in their inner self, but French bread or garlic toast or whatever you'd have with spaghetti. Um, but so you, you, know, you tell your kids, we're having spaghetti and, 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 and French bread. We're gonna have that for dessert or for, for dinner. And they were like, well, is it, is it ready yet? No. How long? 15, 20 minutes. Oh, seriously? I'm like, yes. Can I get a snack? And No, you're going to ruin your dinner. Oh, I'm, I'm starving. You're not starving. You walked under here under your own power, okay? And you're complaining and you're griping. What you can't do is you can set the table. No, I'm good. <laughs> Sound familiar? I mean, the thing is, is I look at Paul groaning to be with Jesus in heaven. It's like, hey, is it time yet? No, it's not. Oh, when? When can I be with you, Jesus? How much longer do I have to wait? When, when can I be with you? Well, you've got, you got work to do right now. Okay, um, how much more longer? How long till dinner? How long can I be with you? I groan for this heavenly dwelling. That's how I like to think of what it means to groan, to be in the presence of God. Not a frustrated groan, but a, but a, a, a lack of, oh, I wish it was now. And I know people would say things like, Lord, come quickly. I struggle with that. I think I've shared this several years ago that I struggle when people say, I just hope the rapture comes right now. I just, Lord, take us all home right now. Like, I, I know what you mean. And I'm kind of like there, I'm with you a little bit. The truth is there's too many people that I'm close to who don't know who Jesus is and I'm not ready for him to come yet because I don't want to spend eternity without those people with me. I want, there are people who I love who are friends of mine that I don't know if they know. There are people in this room right now that you probably don't know if you're going to go to heaven when you die. And for me just to celebrate and go, let's go now, only to create that opportunity for you to spend eternity in hell I'm torn between Lord, come quickly and I still got work to do. Can you give me five more minutes? I hope that's our, all of our attitudes that we're not just so selfish in the fact that we get to go to heaven that we don't care about our neighbor or that family member who doesn't know or we're not certain if they know that there's still work to be done. Yes, we're, we groan, we're ready to be in the presence of God, but there's still work to be done here. Now, the question for today is, do we really groan for heaven? I mean, when was the last time we reacted the way I just kind of described it? I'll be honest with you, for me, myself, not very often. So do we really groan for heaven? Do we, or do we, spend, do we spend time thinking about it? Do we spend time preparing for it? Ensuring our families and our friends are gonna be there? Or we think more about how can we make more money? Or where are we gonna go on vacation next summer? Or what, what's next, you know, this next big purchase I'm looking at doing. Those things aren't bad. They're just not as important as Jesus. Going on vacation is not bad at all. But it's just not more important than our time and energy spent on the kingdom. Figure out 
what next big purchase we're going to buy, the next big tool we're going to buy for the shop. This isn't a bad thing to think about. It's just when we put that as a higher priority than the kingdom. When we're not able to contribute to kingdom needs because we're too busy storing treasures up here in our own garages. Jesus says this in Matthew 6, 19 through 20. He says, do not lay up yourselves treasures on earth where the moth and the rust destroy, where the thieves break in and they steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither the moth nor the rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. These tents are uncomfortable that we have because they are temporary. Life is hard, but life is temporary and life is uncertain. Many of us realize here that our time could come at any moment, but we live our lives sometimes separate than knowing it here and preparing for what is most important. The third thing is this, home is where the heart is. You probably have that in your kitchen or your back door, or maybe in your garage leading into your house. Home is where the heart is. Well, Paul understood that. He, he, he said that he wants to be home with the Lord. He said he'd rather be away from this body. He'd rather be away from this tent and be home with the Lord. Home is truly where the heart is. The reason we should be yearning for heaven, the, we, we shouldn't be yearning for heaven just so we can be with loved ones who've gone with before us. That's not the only reason why we should yearn. That's a good reason. It's not the most important reason. Matter of fact, we sing songs about that, being reunited with people in heaven, different things like that. We shouldn't yearn for heaven just because we know that there are gonna be streets of gold and pearly gates and mansions. Although we know that to be true and we've sing songs about that, but I really believe the best reason to yearn for heaven is simply because that's where Jesus is. And I believe those are the best songs to sing about. It's about Jesus. Paul says he is of good courage. I mean, he's confident in this. He's confident in knowing that his, he yearns to be with God in heaven and away from this body. But since he's in with this body, he knows that he has to be faithful in this moment. He's confident of this. One commentator I read this last week says, do we long for heaven because of what awaits us or do we cling to what we have built here on earth with our own hands? Do we long for heaven because we know what God is in store for us? Or would we just rather hold on to the things we've built and acquired with our own two hands here on this earth? We should be reminded of what Jesus says earlier. We read not to lay up treasures here on earth, but in heaven. Last thing is this, God is watching. Paul writes here in verse 10, he says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive for what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. And all this yearning, we must know that we will have to give an account for the life that we have lived here on earth. So what is the judgment seat of Christ? What is that? We should not look at the judgment seat of Christ as God judging our sins. Our sins have already been paid for by the, by the blood of Jesus Christ. This is, is a more of a judgment of stewardship. Romans 8, 1 tells us there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When God looks at us, he sees the sacrifice of his son. He sees the purity of what Jesus has done and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That's what God sees when he looks at us. So this is not a judgment of whether you're going to heaven or hell. That's the, the great white throne judgment. Okay, that's before he cast the lake of the fire. This is a judgment based off stewardship. God is rewarding us for our lives, but also we have to give an account of ourselves of how we've stewarded things. Now, I'm not one of those pastors who likes to take this, like you're gonna have to give an account and just like, just wanna hammer it down your throat, and make you feel guilty about all the times you were disobedient and all the times you didn't fall through with God and all the times you didn't write that tie check and all the times you decided to sleep in and not go to church and, and just, you're gonna have to give an account. You're gonna stand before the Lord. And you're, yes, that is true. But at this judgment, we'll also be able to stand before God and be rewarded for the work that we have done for our faithfulness. 
we will have to give an account and we'll also be rewarded at this judgment seat. The truth is we're actually in full control of how this meeting will go. Now, we're not conducting it in the sense that we get to say, okay, Jesus, you know, have a seat there. You know, let me talk to you about this whole thing when I was six. You know, we're not in charge of the meeting, how it's gonna be conducted. We really didn't even know how it's gonna go about. We just know that we have to give an account. And our kind of imagination kind of runs wild from that point on. But you get to determine how that meeting goes based off your faithfulness or lack of faithfulness to King Jesus. So you can on earth be thinking, oh my gosh, I can... Uh, is, is there any way I can skip that meeting? Is there any way I can like bypass it? Is there any way I can, you know, not have to stand before God and listen to and be, and be held accountable for those things? Like, like how's that gonna work? Or you can sit there and go, I can't wait to listen to the guy, the man, my, my, my savior, my God, who I devoted my life to look at me and say, thank you and give me a crown. And bless me. I cannot wait for that moment to stand before my Savior and hear him bless and say the things of, where, of my life of faithfulness. We are in control of how that meeting will go. So while we're in this tent, this uncomfortable tent, and we really want to be with Christ, and we're not yet, and there's this tension that we want to be there, but we can't, we have something to do. The question is, going back to that kitchen illustration, and God says, you say, hey, God, I want to be with you. And he's like, well, it's not time yet. Oh, well, how much time? Well, I don't really know. It's not time yet. Well, hey, how about you set the table in the meantime? The question is, would you say, yes, Lord, and start setting the table? Or would you be like most of us when our parents ask us to set the table and we go, no, I don't want to. I'm too tired. Just let me know when it's my time. I'll, I'll show up. I'll show up for the dinner table, but I don't want to have to do any work in the between. God's watching. He's looking for his saints to bless, to reward, but also give an account. Paul says he's prepared for us, or sorry, um, so that we may receive what is due for he's done in the body, whether good or evil. So my question for all of us today is, first of all, individually, do you know Jesus? Do you really know him? Does, and, and the question is, does he also know you? Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life as sin paid for, eternity sealed by the blood of the Lamb? Is your name written in that book? If you're uncertain, can I just encourage you, for those who are online, to email just go to our church website and, and click on anyone on, on the staff page and email them and say, I wanna have lunch with you, I wanna have coffee. I have questions about what it means to be really saved. If you're here today, don't leave today without talking to one of our deacons, one of our staff members and say, I wanna talk to someone about what it means to know that I am a believer in Christ. How do I know that I know? Are you being obedient to him? Do you know what he's calling you to do? Right now, do you know what Jesus, his mission is for you to do? Are we walking in that? Or do we kind of know what it is and hoping he'll change his mind and then we'll jump on board? If you know what God's calling you to do, I tell you the best thing to do, just go ahead and do it. And trust him for everything else. And that goes along with this one is, will you obey? When the Holy Spirit makes it known to you what you are supposed to be doing, where are you supposed to go? Who you should talk to? Will you obey? Will you trust him in that? This isn't our home. It's not easy living. This whole idea of living for Jesus is not easy. It's just worth it. So where are you? You know where you stand. I know where I stand. The question is, are we gonna just dig our heels in or are we gonna be obedient to what God is calling us to do? Let me close this in a word of prayer. God, we know that we, for those of us who have been bought and paid for, we, we, know, are, we know we're your child. We can't wait to be united with you, face to face, to bow before you, to worship you. 
there's people that you've surrounded us with that aren't as confident and certainly not ready for their eternal place. So Jesus, let us be diligent in the meantime. As we yearn, let us be faithful in the meantime. We know that this body is wasting away. So the time and our abilities that we have can seem to be dwindling away. Let us be faithful each and every day. We know this tent you give us is temporary. We know it's uncomfortable. We know living through life is hard. And as we get older, things don't come as easy. Lord, I pray that no matter what, we will be faithful in all things. So the truth is, God, we know you're watching. You're not asleep in heaven. You're not sitting idly by. You're taking note. And you're setting before us things for us to persevere through, people to meet and to share the gospel with. I pray, God, that we would be found faithful. Thank you, God, for how you love us and how you lead us. In your name we pray, amen. If you're here today and you don't know who Jesus is, you know there's things in your life you need to, to settle, someone to talk to. I'll be down here, our student pastor's down here, we'll have a deacon down here as well. On your way out, just come down and talk to us. Or maybe you just wanna, you're new, you're visiting with us and you wanna introduce yourself. We'd love to meet you and greet with you, but pray you have a safe time. Be careful on your way out. The sidewalks are a little slippery, so be careful on your way out. Lord bless you. Have a great and wonderful week.